Um, welcome. Um, it's our pleasure today, it's my pleasure today to introduce Josh Tenenbaum of MIT. Um, Josh did his, his PhD in the Brady Cognitive Science Department at MIT, um, um, looking at Bayesian models of concept learning, and has, um, after that, went spent some time at the psych department at Stanford before now returning um, back to Brady Cognitive Science and, um, and Computer Science at MIT. Um, Josh, Josh, um, Josh's research is extremely interesting to me, and I, I hope to many of you who are here, because it combines um, a number of the different threads of the people involved in um, CLSP, both looking at inference of the, of the human sort as well as inference of the machine sort, and trying to look at real fundamental ways in which the studying these two kinds of processes um, can, um, can help the other. So it's our pleasure to have Josh here today to talk to us about a Bayesian view of inductive learning in humans and machines. Thank you. Thanks. Is this picking me up? Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me down here to talk to you. Um, I, I don't normally talk to heavily language-oriented audiences. Um, and uh, you know, as you said, th there are definitely common themes in, in my work in terms of trying to bridge human and machine learning. Um, another, and, and so, so I hope, I hope if, if the, the topics I talk about today will touch on language, some problems of word learning. Um, but that won't be the, the main content of the talk. Uh, for those of you, though, who, who aren't used to seeing these sorts of things, or this isn't the main thing you think about, um, I, th th I think there's some really deep themes in common between what I'm trying to do and, and fundamental work in language engineering in particular. Uh, for example, in trying to understand how uh, sort of structured symbolic representations and statistical inference mechanisms interact. And I'll try to draw some of these themes and make some analogies to issues in language as I'm going along, which, which are not a normal part of the talk, but I'll try to draw those out. And if you have any interesting thoughts on that, I'd like to, to hear about it. Let me just start off by acknowledging uh, some of my collaborators. Uh, Charles Kemp, Tom Griffiths, and Lauren Schmidt are grad students in the lab. Uh, Fei Shu is on the faculty at UBC in Vancouver. Uh, Neville Sanjan is another grad student in BCS at MIT. Sean Stromson is a postdoc, and Liz Baroff is our lab RA. They're collaborators on different parts of this project. So the, the work I'm going to tell you about today is a program of research on what I like to call the understanding the computational basis of everyday inductive leaps. Let me uh, start off as probably fits a talk on induction by giving you a few examples of what I'm interested in. Uh, so one problem, which is the problem I started working on in my thesis, is a problem of, of concept learning, in particular learning word labels for concepts. So here's a classic example. A lot of talks start off this way. Um, consider yourself in the position of a child who's learning, trying to learn the meaning of the word dog. Um, you're trying to learn what set of things out there in the world are dogs and which ones aren't. And the, the data you get for this induction problem are, is very limited. You have a few examples of things like this. This is just, of course, we're oversimplifying the real world problem in many important ways. But even with, subject to that oversimplification, the problem is still tough. Let's say you have pairs of perceptual experiences of things like this with, uh, let, let's say you actually have words, like the word dog. And the problem here is given these three examples of dogs, you have to figure out this infinite set of things in the world, but constrained set of the things that are dogs, and be able to say which new things are dogs and which ones aren't. And the remarkable thing about children's word learning is they're able to solve these kind of inductive leaps uh, from very few examples, if not to figure out exactly what a word means from just a few examples, to get a pretty good guess. Much better than, say, any machine learning system we've been able to build. Uh, if, if you forget what it was like to solve this problem on a regular basis, let me sort of try to take you back into that mindset by showing you a, a, an artificial world that we, that we run people on in our lab. These are the objects of planet Gazoob, which were designed uh, to sort of capture something of the, of the problem of word learning. Uh, none of these objects are completely uh, novel in the sense they all look like they could be possible objects, but for most of them you're probably hard pressed to come up with a really apt name. Um, I, again, I think that's sort of a typical problem in word learning. And now, just looking at these objects here, getting a sense of what's going on here, let's suppose you met a, a Gazubian, a denizen of this planet, who, gave you, who, who, who showed you a few examples of a word in his language. The word is tufa. Here's a few tufas. And I think you'll probably agree that given these things are tufas, you could probably get a pretty good idea of which other things in this world are tufas and which ones aren't. Right? So it's not like this is just a problem that children solve. Uh, adults can do it too. Now here's another kind of inductive leap which might look different, but formally has some, has some similar properties. And I'll actually be spending more time talking about this and then come back to word learning later. 
So this, these are problems of inductive reasoning, and I'm going to focus on the domain of biology for, a reason, for reasons that you'll see later. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a kind of reasoning problem that there's been a lot of work on going back to probably Lance Rips's thesis in, in 1975, uh, where what you see here are, this is an inductive argument, so these are premises, given information, and this is some conclusion, and you have to evaluate the probability of the conclusion given the premises, or if you like, this is a, some generalization and you have two examples. And the, the information here, there's some familiar categories of, in this domain, so animal species you know about, squirrels and gorillas, and you're told that about some new biological property that's true of these familiar objects. And then you have to say, how likely is that property to apply to this new thing here, horses? And these predicates, like having biotinic acid in their blood, are sometimes called blank predicates. They're supposed to be properties which are sort of biologically relevant, but that's all you're supposed to know about them. Um, so really what this is testing about is your knowledge of biology and how you use that to make, to make inferences about new things. Now, what, again, what makes these challenging from a computational point of view is the problem of generalizing from just one or a few examples and often only positive examples. Uh, as, as you probably know if you've studied any philosophy, this problem of, problems of induction are one of the oldest problems in, in Western thought, really, and most compelling and puzzling problems, uh, sometimes getting a, a, a rather bad reputation in philosophy. Uh, induction has been, called, has been called a scandal or a myth, um, not to mention nicer names like just paradox or riddle. And, 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 and presents a fundamental challenge just from a logical point of view. How is this even possible to, to jump to a, a generalization or an abstraction from such limited data? Uh, in, now machine learning, sort of the modern science of induction, works on problems like this, and I'm sure you guys work on problems like this too, but the focus in machine learning has at least traditionally been on, a, on, a, on a, in some ways an easier problem where there's a lot more data, a lot more labeled data, both positive and negative examples. Um, of course, all learning problems are interesting because there isn't enough data to learn what you to, to learn in a trivial way. But the problem of learning from just one or a few examples is is is, is still at the sort of far extreme end of impoverished data compared to what most of machine learning and pattern recognition works on. Um, now that's starting to change in some interesting ways, and 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 one of the things I'm going to try to do in this talk towards the end is is come back to. Uh, some applications to machine learning of the kind of models for human learning that we've developed, to, uh, which, which reflects an interesting convergence of interests in, in these two fields. Now, the, the approach that I'm going to describe here is what I call a, a theory-based Bayesian term, or theory-based theory Bayesian framework. Um, it's, it's not the most elegant name. I'm looking for a better one. But it has the two important words, theory and Bayesian. So the, the argument for how people the argument is that people are able to solve these kind of induction problems by a combination of two pieces of cognitive machinery. First, a domain general statistical inference framework based on Bayesian inference. Um, is, is everybody familiar with, with that equation? Okay. So I won't spend too much time explaining it. But basically, these hypotheses here, H's, are hypotheses about ways to generalize, uh, such as possible meanings for a word or possible sets of, of animals that could have biotinic acid in their blood. And the data are the few limited positive examples that you're given. Uh, and you evaluate these posterior probabilities given some priors about possible concepts, P of H, and likelihoods, which are what data do you expect to see if a certain concept were the true one you're trying to learn. Uh, so that's, that's pretty standard, although there's a lot of controversy, which we can talk about in the question period, of whether you know, this, is a, this is a good way to describe how people reason, but I'll, I'll argue that it is. Um, but there's an important thing which is missing from just saying this inference is, is some, somehow approximately Bayesian, which is to, to specify what are the relevant hypotheses. That's what this hypothesis space, big H here, um, space of alternative possible concepts. And what are the priors over that space? That plays a crucial role in, in making generalization possible <coughs> and in, as we'll see, in explaining the way people actually generalize. And what I'm going to argue is that we can understand something about where these hypotheses and priors come from by looking at people's intuitive theories of natural domains, such as their intuitive theory of biology, or in other domains, your intuitive theory of physics, or, and so on. Um, sometimes I like to make the analogy that theories are kind of like grammars, um, which is kind of interesting. Actually, Chomsky, in some of his original papers, goes the other way around. He says a grammar is basically like a scientific theory. What, what theories and grammars have in common is they're a set of of abstract principles which specify an infinite set of possible structures. In grammar, it specifies an infinite set of you know, grammatical sentences, acceptable sentences. Uh, for us, a theory generates an infinite space 
potentially infinite space of possible concepts that you could entertain. Right? And these theories will be like probabilistic grammars in that they will assign a prior. And just as, just as in language modeling, the important challenge is how do you come up with a, the right bias in your prior that puts sort of strong probability where you want it to be and not much everywhere else, but still maintain something everywhere. So, you know, every, every possibility has to be in there somewhere because, peop because people's uh, conceptual systems are incredibly flexible. That's the challenge. How do you have a sufficiently biased prior without being closed-minded? And we'll see uh, th that's, that's a, a, a challenge that theories will, will tell us how to meet that challenge. Uh, so the goals in this project are both descriptive modeling goals, the usual goals you want in any kind of scientific model, you know, an elegant model, fits lots of data, few free parameters, fits better, quanti quantitatively higher accuracy than previous models. And I'm also driven by a strong goal to try to come up with a framework that unifies across many different tasks and domains, uh, like I've sketched out a little bit. But there's also sort of deeper explanatory goals. We just want to explain in principle how these inductive leaps are possible how we, and how, say, we might get machines to perform similarly. Um, another issue is trying to make contact with models of cognitive processing. So I'll be giving you these rational statistical analyses which don't talk much about um, memory or other kinds of traditional cognitive ways of speaking. But I think, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of this, I think these models can give us insight into something about why the mechanisms of cognition work the way they do in terms of trying to approximate these rational statistical analyses. Um, another, what, what, I, what I see as really important theme, particularly for areas of cognition outside of language, uh, lang sort of within language people have kind of realized this already, but in a lot of other areas of cog cognition, there's still these, these, these dichotomies of say symbolic approaches versus statistical inference or domain general versus domain specific modes of inference, um, which, which you know, there's been a lot of effort expended into sort of arguing back and forth between these things, as opposed to trying to figure out what are the distinctive contributions and interactions between, say, symbolic representations and statistical inference. Even being able to see those as being harmoniously compatible is, is still something that much of the field has yet to, I think, agree on. Uh, but that's one thing we're going to try to do in, in this work. Um, and in particular, to try to, uh, to try to make a connection between what's, what's often a, a strongly theory-based view of inductive inference and more of a bottom-up similarity-based or statistical-based view. I'll, I'll give you concrete examples of that in a second. Okay, so the, the plan for today is I'll spend a fair amount of time on the first item talking about <coughs> inference with these blank biological properties just to give you an idea of how this theory-based Bayesian approach works. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about word learning uh, basically, uh, there's a few other case studies which, depending on the time, how much time there is, I could go into where they're, 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 the basic approach is the same, but the theory changes in some interestingly different ways, leading to different hypotheses and priors, and thus leading to different behavior. Uh, I probably won't have time for this stuff, so I'll skip that. And then hopefully there'll be a little bit of time to talk about how not only can we use theories to guide induction, but how we might themselves acqu acquire these theories <coughs> via statistical inference from data. And again, if there's, if there's time, I'll talk about some machine learning applications to what's sometimes called the problem of semi-supervised learning, learning concepts from a few labeled examples and lots of unlabeled examples, uh, which, which I see as sort of the machine learning parallel to the, pro to the cognitive problems that we're working on here. All right, so again, here's this, here are these um, arguments with blank predicates. Uh, these, these are so-called general arguments where the conclusion is some generalization. And you might say, well, which, is, which provides better evidence that all mammals have biotinic acid in their blood? The three examples of cows, horses, and rhinos having biotinic acid in their blood, or the three examples of cows, dolphins, and squirrels. And most people choose the latter, which is, which is kind of interesting because there's a sense in which these somehow seem to be a more representative sample of all mammals, cows, dolphins, and squirrels. Um, even though dolphins and squirrels are not particularly typical mammals, say, compared to horses and rhinos, uh, somehow the fact that this is a more diverse, seems to be a more diverse sample of of evidence seems to provide better evidence for the generalization here. Uh, so that's one thing that people have tried to understand in this literature. Now, beyond qualitative phenomena, we can get quantitative data, which is going to be important <coughs> for evaluating our models in a rigorous way. Uh, th this is an example. I'll start off with the data set that was collected by Osterson and Smith and their colleagues, <coughs> where, where subjects rated the strength of these generalizations. Um, in, in this experiment, every generalization had this form. There were always three, it was always the, the, the there was always some blank predicate which varied randomly. That's just property P here. Again, it's something like having biotinic acid in your blood or having sesamoid bones, something which 
a priori, there doesn't seem to be any particular reason to think is more true of some mammals than others. Uh, and then there are, uh, there are three premises, and what was varied across trials were the, the species which appeared as the three examples. So you can think of this as kind of like a measure of how representative various samples of species are. Now, because they were interested in modeling this data in terms of similarity, they also collected similarity ratings for all pairs of mammals used in this experiment. There were just 10 mammals, and so they had a separate group of subjects rate the similarity of all pairs of mammals. Now here's the kind of models that, that uh, Osterson and colleagues were trying to develop, and these models are still considered to be sort of the best quantitative models that people have of this domain. Uh, there are, there, you'll see problems with them, but sort of as quantitative behavioral models, they seem to do pretty well. Um, so we're trying to evaluate the strength of the generalization from a set of examples X to the conclusion all mammals. And the appro the, 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 these approaches work by accessing some memory, stored memories of mammals. <coughs> so that you have some set of mammals in your memory. And what you do is you go over that set of mammals, summing over I, uh, of the similarity of each mammal you know about to the set of examples X. So it's a sum of similarity over all of your mammals in memory. Um, and which you can see sort of graphically here. Let's say each blue dot is a mammal in your memory, and each X is one of the examples for this particular generalization. And so you, for each mammal, you compute its similarity to the examples, and you just sum that up over all the mammals to get some sense of like how well these examples cover the space of mammals. Now, there's one more thing you need to specify here, which is how do you compute similarity from one thing to a set of things? Um, again, this is a general theme that comes up in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of learning work. If you get the right similarity metric, lots of things work out nicely. But if you get the wrong similarity metric, then uh, everything is hopeless. Well, so here that turns out to, to be pretty important. The, the similarity metric, though, that we're talking about is not, we, we assume we're given the right pairwise similarity metric. The question is, how do you compute a setwise similarity metric? How do you decide the similarity of some mammal to this set of three examples? Now, one possibility is you might take the sum of the similarity to each of them on its own. Another possibility is you might take the maximum. Uh, now, if you take the maximum, only the closest one counts. And then you just go over all the mammals looking at the closest example to each mammal. Now, in comparing these approaches, they, they, might, they, they seem kind of similar. One is linear, the other is nonlinear. But they both kind of increase monotonically as new examples are added. The sum can only go up, same with the max. Um, there are some reasons to prefer the sum similarity approach. If you're familiar with any kind of exemplar models in cognitive psychology, like exemplar models of categorization or memory, uh, that's typically what they work by some kind of sum of similarity traces. If you're familiar with heavy and learning and neural networks, that essentially lays down a linear superposition of memory traces, which then, in, in generalizing to new things, amounts to a sum similarity computation. Uh, it's analogous to some pattern recognition techniques like kernel density estimation. Similarity is often thought of as an exponential function of, exponentially decaying function of distance in some space, in which case summing up similarity is like summing up the, the you know, basis functions in a kernel density estimate. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to go with this. On the other hand, these, this model goes with the max similarity. Uh, why? Well, it just has to do with the fit to the data. Um, what I'm showing you here are Con contrast of the model predictions along the x-axis with the human judgments along the y-axis. So each dot represents one of these arguments where there are some set of examples, set of three examples, and the conclusion is always all mammals. Again, so you can think of this like as a measure of how representative this particular sample of three mammals is. And uh, the ratings are normalized to zero to one. And what you can see here is that for this max similarity model, uh, generalizations which the model thinks are strong also tend to be the ones that people think are strong. You have a, a pretty good correlation of around 0.9. And for these high-level cognitive judgments, that's, that's pretty impressive. The sum similarity model, on the other hand, gets a negative correlation with the data. And as, as hard as it is to get a high positive correlation in a cognitive model, it's also pretty hard to get a significant negative correlation, particularly when you're working with a model which, uh, in, in many other domains of learning, is, is the reigning champion, is considered to be the, the standard model to beat. So there's something kind of curious going on here. You might, pro probably many of you find the max similarity model more intuitive, which makes sense because what we're showing here is how well the model fits people's intuitions. And that's, so that makes sense. The question is, why do our intuitions work this way in this domain, but not this way, when in, in many other domains they actually work more like this? 
This, th this is a pretty generic problem with the similarity model in that, or I don't know, generic finding in that this max similarity across several different data sets <coughs> in this biological induction domain, uh, the max similarity model does pretty well, whereas this sum similarity model is more erratic, um, often negatively or weakly correlated with the people's judgments. So again, it, 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 if we wanted to try to explain inductive reasoning in similarity type terms, we're left with some questions that don't really seem like they have answers within the similarity paradigm. Why does one of these models do so well and another one do so poorly? Are there cases where maxim might fail? Is there some sort of maybe more rational strategy, which this is just an approximation to, which would explain why maxim works the way it does? And th this, this, these kinds of questions are ones which, at least for me, uh, are strongly influenced by, by David Marr's paradigm for studying vision. Um, are people familiar with this sort of way of studying an, uh, an information processing system, Mars levels of explanation? Well, just in brief, um, Mar, Mar suggested that you might study a visual system or any intelligence system at, at several different levels, including the neural hardware that implements the computation, the specific representations and algorithms over which computation works, and sort of most, maybe most originally for him, what he called the level of computational theory, which is analyzing the abstract information processing problem to be solved, which is not dependent on the hardware or even the particular representations you use, uh, but might be in common across machines and humans who have to solve the same kind of problem. It's about understanding the structure of the environment and the task that you have to solve being in this environment. And that's, uh, that's where we're going to focus the rest of our work, trying to understand induction at this level. And uh, among other things, that might give some insight into what's going on at the level of representation and algorithm. So in if you wanted to do a computational theory of vision, the typical place to start with is looking at the physics, optics of light, and surface reflection, and so on. Uh, in speech, as there's, there's also been some very nice computational analyses in, in say, of human speech perception, which start off looking at acoustical properties, um, for instance, or properties of the speech signal. Um, what about in, in more high-level cognition? Well, there's relevant scientific work to look at here, and that is the scientific theory of biology. Um, and, and what I'm going to argue is that some important aspects of the, of the scientific theory of biology, the way species and their properties are really related in the world, as, far, as best as biology can tell us, those actually seem to uh, be somehow reflected in our in internal intuitive theories of biology and are used to guide our generalizations. So one important principle is the idea of a tree-structured taxonomy. Right? This, is, uh, this, is a, this is a picture from a recent article trying to reconstruct the phylog phylogeny of mammals based on genetic data. But the, the notion of, of tree structures goes back certainly to the, the theory of evolution, which motivates why you would have a tree structure because of the, the evolutionary branching process. But even before that, people, people uh, seem to think this was a good, that, that hierarchies were a good way to classify the natural world. Um, and there's some interesting cross-cultural evidence by people like Scott Atron uh, showing that this, the hierarchical taxonomies seem to show up across cultures, including, say, you know, much less technologically advanced, but uh, biologically more sophisticated cultures like hunter-gatherer cultures. So we might start off by making a, a sort of a theory-based approach to induction by taking this, let's say taking the, the same similarity data that went into the other model and doing a hierarchical clustering to come up with some idea of people's taxonomy. And here's, uh, this is just an example of doing that for the 10 animal species that were used in this experiment. And you can see it kind of probably looks intuitive to you in terms of the, 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 the groupings that appear in the tree, like you have the primates here, uh, you have these sort of sea mammals, which that's not really a biological grouping, but it seems to be intuitive to many people. Um, you have the rodents, you have the land mammals, uh, and so on. So now how might we use this knowledge structure to guide generalization? Well, what Atron, Atron when, he, when he was studying uh, folk taxonomies like this, was particularly interested in them because of their role in guiding induction. And he actually cited an example of the principle of systematic induction that was developed in biology. This is like the study of cladistics or you know, taxonomy in, in biology, pre-genetics. Uh, and so here's this fundamental principle that biologists had, had converged on. Given a property found among members of any two species, the best initial hypothesis is that the property is also present among all species that are included in the smallest higher order taxon containing the original pair of species. Right? So that means the lowest common uh, node in the tree that spans both of the examples. Uh, so how does that do here? Well, 
So it, it does explain the basic, some of the basic diversity effect. Remember there was this idea that more diverse evidence uh, seemed to, or more diverse examples seemed to, be, seemed to be better evidence for the generalization. Uh, so this was, this was a generalization which was rated as very strong by people, um, getting a score of 0.76 where, where the maximum was 0.82 on a scale of 0 to 1. And that can be explained by this principle because what's the, what's the smallest taxonomic category including all of these examples? Well, it's just all mammals, right? We, in this tree, that's the, that's the only node in the tree which spans the examples. And then we could contrast it with, say, this one where we have cows, horses, and rhinos where the lowest node is much lower. So if people are just going with this systematic induction rule then, and always and just generalizing to the lowest common denominator, if you like, then, then here they would generalize to just the large herbivores and not to all mammals, which might explain why this is one of the weakest arguments in the set. But some problems come up in that there are other, many, many other are, uh, more fine-grained preferences which are not captured by this principle. So here we have a set of examples, seals, dolphins, and squirrels. Uh, which people actually rate as being pretty weak. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the weakest, but it's, it's definitely in the lower, say, 25%. Uh, but if you look in this tree, the, the lowest uh, node in the tree that spans all of these is just the node for all mammals. Um, and I think that's intuitive, even if you didn't agree with exactly this tree. It's hard to think of any more specific uh, sub-kind of mammals that includes seals, dolphins, and squirrels, but not everything else. right? So it seems like we're not quite, there's some more fine-grained ideas going on here than just simple taxonomy. So what's the challenge here? Well, we have two classical models, uh, one of which, this, this, this max similarity model, which seems to be sort of qu have, have strong descriptive power. You get high correlations with quantitative judgments. But it's, but it's not very well motivated on explanatory grounds. And then on the other hand, you have this more well-motivated theory-based approach. Uh, but it doesn't actually seem to describe what people do. So do we have to move on to another domain? Or can we think about some way to build models with the best of both features? Well, you can guess which, which <laughs> I'm going to suggest. <laughs> um, so we're going to try to take an approach which builds on the theory-based approach, but integrates it with statistical inference, both in terms of, in terms of how we do the inference, instead of replacing that systematic induction rule with the Bayesian inference, but also uh, by turning the theory into more of a probabilistic generative model, as if, again, by analogy and language, taking a grammar and putting probabilities on it to get much more fine-grained predictive power. It's basically the same idea. Um, so the, the approach here is, is to replace what we started off with where we had um, each hypothesis just being one... Uh, oh, 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 actually, wait, I'm skipping ahead for myself. Okay, so here's the first approach. The first approach is Look, is going to look actually a lot like the, um, the original taxonomic one, where uh, each node in the tree is, corresponds to one hypothesis. So for example, here's one hypothesis about how to generalize, which would include all the animals. Um, here's another hypothesis, which includes all the land animals. Uh, this one includes just the primates, just the elephants and rhinos, whatever those are, <laughs> um, just the dolphins, and so on. Each node in the tree could be one hypothesis for how to generalize. Um, and then uh, the, 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 there's lots of ways to define probabilities over this hypothesis space. A simple one, it turns out it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much. Um, just for simplicity, we, we'll just take a uniform prior over, all, over those 19 hypotheses, one for each node in this tree. Um, the likelihood turns out to do something interesting. Again, the likelihood is the probability of seeing a particular set of examples given the hypotheses. And uh, it, it, for this task, it doesn't really matter that much. You can choose something simple which is just, a met, just say, one or zero, depending on whether the examples are consistent with the hypothesis or not. Um, if you, you know, you, that's the, simple, the simplest measure of, of the predictions of your hypothesis are just, are the examples consistent or not? But uh, you can get something more fine-grained if you think about the sampling process that gives rise to these examples. And it yields something which we call the size principle here, where the likelihood is proportion, inversely proportional to the size of the hypothesis. The, that's the number of things contained in the hypothesis raised to the nth power, where n is the number of examples. Uh, at least that's for any consistent hypothesis. It's zero otherwise. Just, just to motivate this, um, imagine you were playing a simple sort of number concept learning game where the objects were just numbers from 1 to 100, and you had just two hypotheses. One is that the concept was the even numbers, and another was the, hypo the concept was just the multiples of 10. Well, if you saw one example like the number 60, that would seem like, you know, maybe 
slight evidence for the more specific hypothesis uh, because it's slightly a coincidence that if you were sampling from this large set that you would just get that one there inside the, the more specific hypothesis. But if you saw, let's say, these four examples, 10, 30, 60, and 80, well, now it seems like that would be a huge coincidence to get four examples all inside the more specific hypothesis of multiples of 10 if you're really sampling from the whole set. And that kind of intuition is, is, is going to be fundamental in a lot of different kinds of inductive learning tasks, in particular in word learning, where it's, you're, it's very likely to assume you're getting some kind of representative sample from whatever set you're, you're, you're trying to learn. Uh, and that this, this notion of a suspicious coincidence that favors the more specific hypothesis uh, over the more general hypothesis is, is an important part of Bayesian induction. You can also see how this may relate to that fundamental principle of taxonomic induction, which said choose the lowest common denominator, right? Choose the lowest taxonomic node, which spans the examples. What we're seeing here is you should, you should have a bias towards the lower ones, the more specific ones, but it should increase with more data. When you just have one example, it shouldn't be as strong as when you have a lot of examples. Okay, so we put these things together, and what, oh, there's one more thing we need, which is, um, this tells us, we, we, when we put these priors and likelihoods together, we can compute essentially the, the posterior probability of generalizing to the, to the hypothesis of all mammals, given these examples. But that doesn't necessarily tell us, if we want to model some of these specific inferences, like how likely is it that a horse would have this property, given that squirrels, dolphins, and seals do, we need a little bit more machinery. Um, and there again, we're just going to invoke a standard Bayesian mechanism, which, which is called model averaging or hypothesis averaging. The idea is we want to compute the probability that some new object Y is in the concept, given the examples X. What we have is a distribution over a hypothesis space of possible concepts. And the, the, the trick is that each of those hypotheses makes a prediction about whether or not some new object is in the concept. So we can, we can compute these predictions by summing over the hypothesis space of the probability that Y is in the concept given that hypothesis is the true extension of the concept, the right way to generalize, weighted by the posterior probability of that particular way of generalizing that particular concept given the examples. So this is what we just saw how to compute using the tree structure, and then this is just the sum over all hypotheses of their predictions, and under the simplest way of doing it, it's again just one or zero, depending on whether the new object is in the hypothesis or not. Um, another way to express this, which probably should be pretty intuitive, is it's just the sum over all the hypotheses in common to the new thing and the old thing. That's sort of trying to see how many possible ways of generalizing that are consistent with the examples are also consistent with the new thing you want to generalize to. And it, 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 the, 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 gr the greater that ratio, the, the higher the probability of generalization, the hypotheses are also weighted by their relative posterior probability. So the more likely ways of generalizing contribute more to, to classifying new objects. Does that make sense? Okay, so how does the model do? Well, actually, terribly. <laughs> so there's the model on top. Um, what you can see is that the correlations aren't very, very good, but the, the plot is more revealing than that um, in that Let's just zoom in on one of these here. Uh, this is, again, this is this general set where there's three examples, and you're, you're trying to see how, how much should you generalize to all mammals. Um, what you can see is that the model, there's a whole bunch of arguments here which the model is giving probability of one to. The model is saying, I'm absolutely sure you should generalize to all mammals, um, even though people give a wide range of ratings. Uh, here I'm just showing two of these. These are the two I showed you before. Uh, the examples cows, dolphins, and squirrels compared with the examples seals, dolphins, and squirrels. Um, people rate this weak and they rate this strong. And unfortunately, this model, just like Atron's taxonomic induction principle, also rates these strong. Uh, and, and, and basically for the reason that we already saw, in both cases, there's just one hypothesis consistent with the data. Um, here it's all mammals, and here it's also all mammals. But somehow that doesn't seem right. Somehow it seems like, in this case at least, there might be some competing alternative hypothesis that seems like we might want to consider it. Like, for example, maybe, maybe the concept is really just true of the aquatic mammals, which would explain dolphins and seals, and then squirrel is maybe an outlier or some weird mutant or something like that. Whereas there isn't such a simple explanation here, it's like you'd have to, if you wanted to come up with an alternative explanation, something which would explain seeing dolphins, squirrels, and cows, but not having the property generalized to all mammals, you'd have to posit three different suspicious coincidences for each of these. And that's sort, of the, that's sort of the direction that our model is going to grow in. Um, we, we realized that there was an important part of biology, the scientific theory of biology, which we weren't taking into account, which is the notion of, of features arising from a mutation process. Right? So it's just not the case in biology that features, some features always 
uh, just true of one branch of a tree, features arise by a, a stochastic process of mutation and then are preserved through selection, with the result being that a novel feature or any feature could appear uh, anywhere across the tree, although there are certain distributions are more likely than others that, that come about from the dynamics of, of the mutation process. So our next step was to try to develop our theory and po again put a more fine-grained uh, pr prior on our theory based on the idea of a mutation process, thinking that since that's the way it actually works in the, in the real world of biology, maybe somehow our brains have, have adopted a prior which is appropriate for that kind of domain. Uh, so the, the specific prior that we use is actually one that that's, uh, is, is a simple model that mathematical biologists have used. It's called the Poisson arrival process. And it, ba it basically you imagine choosing some feature value for the root of the tree, and then that sort of spreads out or propagates down each branch, and at any point along any branch, there's some small probability of a mutation. Uh, and then you just look to see at the bottom what you're, what you're left with. Uh, the probability of a mutation along any branch is just given by this expression, and it depends on the length of the branch and the mutation rate. So the longer branch, there's more likely to be a mutation, and of course that's parameterized by the mutation rate. So just to illustrate, let's say we started off with a feature that was black, it could be black or white, let's say, um, at the root of the tree, and then going down along this branch, there was one mutation, um, so, it it, so it was effectively white at that internal node, and then no more mutations, so it's white here. Going down the left branch, no mutations. Going down this right branch here, let's say you had two mutations, uh, so it turns white and then black again, uh, and then that black passes on and so on, oops, sorry, so on down the tree. Let's say you had another mutation there. So this is just a probabilistic generative model for labeling the nodes of this tree. And what this essentially gives us is a prior over all possible concepts, where a concept, a possible concept is just some, some, way, some way the feature could be distributed over the objects in the world. Um, and what's nice about this prior is it, it assigns some prior, to, some probability to every possible concept. It doesn't rule anything out, but it's strongly biased in, in useful ways that, de that depend on the number and the length of the branches needed to spam this hypothesis. So for example, um, a, a, a labeling that cuts the data, that cuts the objects along one branch is more likely than one that requires two or more branches. Uh, in biology, this is called a monophyletic property, which is something true of just one branch. This is called a polyphyletic property. Um, these are polyphyletic properties are more common than you might think. A lot of the most important um, features that we care about are polyphyletic, like say, being warm-blooded, um, having a complex eye, being able to fly, uh, falling in love, forming long-term monogamous uh, relationships. Um, and the argument that biologists give is that these features are extremely useful in an evolutionary setting. They have strong survival value. So the, the, it's the process of selection that actually, that, 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 that is, is shaping this, this distribution. It's not just about <coughs> mutations. Um, so what we'll see in actually fitting this model to data, the mutation rate that we need to fit people's judgments is actually some, substantially higher than it would be in actual biology, but that's because we're not explicitly modeling the selection process. And there's, there's a lot more of these polyphyletic properties. This is still rarer than that, but it's not negligible. Um, another uh, feature of this prior is, of course, that it's more likely, or it prefers labelings which cut the data along a long branch like here than along a short branch like this, right? Which again seems kind of cognitively natural, as not just biologically natural. This seems like this would be a more distinctive cluster and so it would be more likely to have its own features. Um, now, this is just a, a footnote designed to generate some interest or controversy, but <laughs> there's, there's, a there's been a lot of work, if you're familiar with kind of Bayesian concept learning and machine learning, a lot of people have been trying to do things like this. If you know Tom Mitchell's book on machine learning, for example, there's a sort of chapter six talks about Bayesian concept learning. It's mostly a, been a textbook and non-applicable um, framework, basically because people haven't been able to come up with good priors for, for, for working with these models, priors which have all the properties that we see here. Namely, you, you assign a strong bias in, in, in to, to, the, to the concepts that are important, but you're not dogmatic, and every concept gets some prior probability, so you're robust to exceptions and outliers. And also, the prior has to be able to be tractable. You have to be able to compute it in an efficient way. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about computational tractability here, but, but we can afterwards. In brief, by, by, by defining a prior over a tree in this way, you, you can do all the computations you want using just belief propagation on the tree or probabilistic inference on this tree-structured graphical model, uh, which you're probably all familiar with, the, the virtues of that. Um, 
That allows us to efficiently sum over all possible hypotheses or all possible concepts in this domain under this prior. So what happens when we, when we do this? All we're doing here is now changing the, the prior from this purely taxonomic one, which just assigns probability to the taxonomic nodes, to this sort of ev evolutionary one, which has this process of mutation uh, giving rise to the prior. Well, this was our original model, and here's the new model. Uh, you can see it, it makes all the difference. Um, we're now being able to fit people's data across both these general and specific arguments with different numbers of examples in a way that is, um, is, is, is pretty much always equal to or better, pretty much always better than the best of the similarity models. Now, it's not that much better because the best similarity model is already pretty good, right? It sure is a lot better than this other similarity model, which again is sort of the general gold standard of similarity <coughs> models. The advantage of our, of our sort of evolutionary Bayesian approach is not just that it fits the data a bit better, but that it's motivated in terms of a domain theory and an uh, explanation of why it actually works this way. Now, you m some of you might be suspicious, or at least I tend to get some suspicions that, you know, do people really have some implicit knowledge about mutations and, and hierarchies and taxonomies and all that sort of thing? And I should clarify sort of what I'm claiming, what I'm not claiming. I'm not saying that people certainly have any explicit knowledge about mutations or even any implicit knowledge. All that matters is that they have the right kind of statistical distribution. Um, it's, again, if you want to take an analogy with grammar, uh, all, all we need here is something, we're, we're using this, this theory to just parameterize a certain prior, which is very useful, and there might be other ways of, of parameterizing it. Um, but still, there's, there's a lot of knowledge here, there's, there's at least some knowledge that we're positing to people, and it's somewhat indirect um, evidence for that. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've done is trying to try out many different variants of this model, varying both the hypothesis space and the kind of prior, but also varying the statistical inference machinery to try to understand how much work is the Bayesian part doing, how much work is, this is the hierarchy doing, how much work is this particular way of assigning the prior doing. And I, the, the short answer is they all, they, they all are very important. <laughs> um, I don't have time to show you all the specific comparisons, but just to give you a flavor for this, and again to show you the value of the, the particularly biological mutation part of this prior, let me just compare, give one comparison to a, 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 to a model which is, which is almost the same, but the prior just, just, just a little bit different. Um, one feature of, the, of this mutation prior is a kind of Occam's razor, right? It's, it favors hypotheses that span few branches of the tree, or that it can be just cut once as opposed to having lots of, uh, you know, different feature values sprinkled throughout the tree, right? It favors having all the feature, the new feature concentrated in just one branch of the tree, which you can think of as just some basic kind of Occam's razor. Um, and we could imagine a model which looks just like this one, only instead of generating the prior from a mutation process, we just build in a similar kind of Occam's razor, but without the sort of mutation motivation. So one way to do that would be to just take this, the probability of mutation, which remember under the Poisson arrival process, depends on the branch length, favors longer branches, and just replace this with a, with a process that doesn't depend on the branch length. So we can just say any mutation along any branch is equally likely, and, and there's some small probability. So this still prefers hypotheses with fewer mutations, that's, you know, cuts that span fewer branches, but it doesn't have any dependence on the length of the branch. And what you can see here is there's, there's at least one important qualitative phenomenon, which when you do, when you, when you set up the prior in a slightly different way, you get totally wrong. So one of the oldest phenomena here, and it's a, it's a, it's a well-known kind of phenomena in cognitive psychology, it's a typicality effect. Um, it, people prefer generalizing from more typical uh, instances of a category, like horses to all mammals, than from more atypical ones, like seals. So this is a weaker generalization than this one. And we, we did a simple experiment where we just had people ring these generalizations. There was just one, one premise, example and a, a general conclusion. So it's essentially just a pure typicality effect. Uh, and what you can see here is the similarity-based model gets a significant positive correlation with this data. The, when you ask people to make judgments from just one example, they're pretty noisy because uh, this, th th you know, this is more unconstrained. Um, so none of the models do great here. But still, the max similarity model does okay. Um, and the model I just told you about also does pretty well. Um, that's this mutation process. But if we use this, this Bayesian model, which is just slightly different, uh, with the, the sort of Occam prior instead of the mutation prior, it, then it now comes out negatively correlated with this. And, and there are good reasons to, 
why that is, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, on all the other data I showed you so far, this model does great. It does just as well as this model. But here's a particularly important cognitive phenomenon, which this model gets exactly backwards. And we've seen the same kind of thing for all the other ingredients of our model, really suggesting that the more biologically realistic you make it, uh, the, the more it seems to describe how people are reasoning. So I, I find this to be a very, um, I don't know, I, I, that, that kind of makes me curious and delighted <laughs> in this research program. Um, because it seems like you, you have a very nice case, case study of, of, of explaining why people's induction can work, why inductive inference can be successful in the real world, in that it seems that our implicit theory that generates our prior is actually the way the world works. And it's not really that different from scientific biology, except for the, the main features that we look at. The structural principles are basically the same, but, but scientists these days are applying those same kind of principles to genes, whereas we're applying them to more behavioral anatomical properties that we can more easily observe. But since these observable features are the consequences of genes, the same structures, the same kinds of structures should still apply. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Uh, what time do we, do we normally end sort of about? Okay. Um, so I'll skip some of the stuff about, what I was going to do is do some more comparison with the similarity bias models, but I'll skip some of that. Um, the short answer is that, or the, the short version of this part of the story is that we can, um, we can understand something about why the similarity models uh, work so well, basically by showing both empirically and analytically that this max similarity model, the one that works really well, is an approximation to the Bayesian, evolutionary Bayesian model that I showed you. Um, we can also find places where it breaks down and where the Bayesian model makes the right prediction but the max similarity model doesn't, but I won't uh, go, in, go into that for time. You can ask me about it later. Um, one thing that, that is interesting that you might ask about this whole research program, and it's going to be directly relevant for, say, the prospects of application to machine learning. Um, we started off with this notion of similarity given by people um, as the the, the, the basis for our hypothesis space, right? We took people's similarity judgments, and then we did hierarchical clustering to come up with this taxonomy. So you might say, well, we haven't really explained away similarity because we just used it as the input to our model. And what are we going to do in a, in a new domain where we don't have a good similarity metric, where we don't have people to just rate similarity? Um, so here's, a, let me show you about, tell you about a similar, sort of a similarity-free alternative to this approach, um, which is, is also probably a more compelling cognitive model and maybe more applicable to machine learning. Um, where basically instead of coming up with the taxonomic tree based on similarity judgments, we come up with the taxonomic tree as, a, as the best explanation of some observed features. Um, so just as an example, here's a set of, of features that we worked with where people were given 48 animals and 85 features and rated which animal had which feature. So for elephants, you know, you get features, various perceptual features like gray, hairless, but also things like inactive um, or timid, smart. And then the problem that we're trying to solve here is, say, given all these, I'm calling them old features, but let's say they're the known features of these species, uh, we now have some new feature that we want to make an inference about, let's say having biotinic acid in your blood. And the question is, can we somehow use this data to figure out how to generalize this, this new feature from very few labeled examples? If you, again, if you're familiar with the problem of semi-supervised learning, that's, that's where we're getting to. Uh, and so, and our, our story for this is, again, it's, it's, it's basically the same kind of model, but I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in a, in a broader probabilistic framework, which is also kind of inspired by a grammar analogy. So the theory here are these principles which generate a structural description of the domain, uh, if you like, a parsing of the, this data matrix, um, which then provides a prior for generalizing to new features. Uh, so so the, the, theory, uh, the, the theory consists of the principles which I just told you about. The structural description is a tree where each species is assigned to some leaf node of the tree. And features are distributed over this tree in some way. And the, 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 the principles of the theory assign a, a, a prior probability to any possible structural description, uh, any possible tree, any possible way of assigning features. The mutation process right, will, again, prefer that any one feature change occurs relatively few times and on longer branches. And that assigns a likelihood to this observed feature matrix. We'll just call this, uh, oops, there's supposed to be a D there. Oh, that'll be later. OK. Anyway, this, this assigns a, a likelihood to the observed feature matrix. Um, so essentially, what, what, we're, uh, what we view this system as doing is 
estimating the most probable structural description, which fuses the top-down probabilistic constraints of the theory with the bottom-up constraints of the observed features, and then uses exactly the machinery I just told you about to come up with the prior for generalizing new features. And here I'm just comparing this feature-based model on uh, th three of the tasks I told you about before, this, these general tasks and these two specific tasks, um, specific inferences. Uh, now, what you can see is that both the Bayes model and the Max similarity model get worse because it, these features are generated by different subjects for different reason, um, and they may not have the most relevant features, but they still do kind of okay. I mean, the Bayesian model seems to work best. Um, the, uh, what, what, th th there's two points to get out of this. One is that the model works just fine without similarity, um, and it, you can you can view what's what what you're you can view what this model is doing as basically a kind of um, unsupervised learning stage. That's the left side of this graph, uh, giving a prior for rapid supervised learning on the right here. But there's also an interesting contrast with what I'll call a raw Bayesian approach. So here, uh, it, it, we here what we're doing is trying to come up with a prior that doesn't use the theory. So we might just say, suppose that the new feature that we're learning is just one of the old features that we've seen before. Right? It's kind of analogous to, in language modeling, uh, you know, having, a, having a model with no smoothing or something, just, uh, just assuming that the, the, the probability distribution is just the empirical distribution of things that you've seen in your corpus. Um, so we assume this new feature is just one of the features we've seen before, uh, and, and then we, we say, how well can we generalize based on that? And again, what you can see here is that does much more poorly than using this uh, if you like, this theory-based probabilistic smoother. I'll just skip this generative theory. Okay. Um, so in sum, what we've, what we've seen here is uh, an, an approach to explaining inductive reasoning in a particular domain where, excuse me, uh, where, where the, the inference is, is, is provided by the combination of a top-down theory and some general purpose statistical inference machinery. What I'll show you is just one more example of how we apply this in a slightly different domain where the, um, where, where the general inference framework is exactly the same, but we make a little bit of a change to the theory and that produces some big domain specific differences. Um, so here's the problem of word learning, which, which I introduced to you. Uh, I'll just show you a little bit about our experimental task here. We give people, let's say, one example of a, of a word like Here's a zav. These, these are, this is an experiment done with familiar objects, but we, I'll show you one with novel objects in a second. And then we ask them to pick out the other zavs, or we might give them several examples. And what you can see when you do this is that people, what I'm, what I'm plotting here, people's generalization to new objects uh, for one object, one example of a zav versus three examples, which naturally cluster at different levels of generality. Three, sub, three subordinates, like three different Dalmatians, three different dogs, basic level instances or three different superordinates, three different animals. And what you can see is that uh, with one example, people are giving you something like a gradient of generalization. They're pretty much always picking other Dalmatians, given this one Dalmatian example. Uh, much of the time, other dogs, but rarely anything beyond that. Whereas with three examples, they lock in on, the, on what seems to be the most natural level right away. Um, so with three Dalmatians, the, those are the first three zaps you've seen, you only pick at other Dalmatians. Um, here you only pick another dog, and so on. So you get this transition from, a, from something that looks a little bit like a gradient with significant differences all the way down here to something which seems more all or none as you get just a few more examples. Uh, this is just showing you sort of the same kind of pattern with children. With children, the gradient is more pronounced. There's really a very graded pattern of generalization from one example, but m relatively more all or none generalization to the most specific level. Um, remember, it, Remember again, this, this principle of taxonomic induction generalized to the lowest common denominator uh, that we started off with in the theory-based approach and which we showed in our approach, that, that's what you get from the size principle and the likelihood. As you get a few more examples, that becomes the, 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 the sort of salient suspicious coincidence. You don't want to generalize just beyond that set. Um, but the key thing about, again, in the Bayesian analysis is that that um, lowest common denominator principle doesn't kick in until you have a few examples. And if we, if we contrast, say, the behavior of, of people in this domain with this max similarity model, that gives you a gradient all the way through. So in the other domain, the max similarity model works very well. But here, it really is just miserable. It doesn't respond with any degree of sensitivity 
to the, to the number or distribution of the examples. Whereas the Bayesian model, uh, which we use, we basically follow exactly the same methodology. We take similarity, we construct hierarchical clustering, we associate hypotheses with nodes in the tree. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the key difference in this model is that here we're going to apply that, uh, that, that simple taxonomic bias. Here, the hypotheses are not going to follow a mutation process. They're just going to correspond to nodes in the tree. And if you think about it, I think that reflects an important difference between words and properties, right? Um, words we take as labels for categories. And there's a lot of evidence that children in particular have a taxonomic bias in early word learning, that they particularly think of certain kinds of common nouns as being labels for taxonomic categories, uh, which is very different from properties which we might expect to be distributed in, in somewhat more arbitrary ways over the world of objects. So that's, that's pretty much the only difference, um, is, is putting in this prior which favors a one-to-one -one mapping of words onto taxonomic clusters instead of a more statistical distribution. And then we, we can do a very good job of fitting the data. There's the, the, we, we can show, although I don't have time to tell you about it, that the main difference between the adults and the children here uh, can be accounted for in terms of a basic level bias. So we need some additional, it seems that adults have some additional bias over and above the, the prior I just told you about to prefer to map words onto basic level uh, categories. And we can see something, we can see basically the same behavior with these artificial objects. So again, here are the Vesuvian objects. We can do the same kind of experiment. We can also collect similarity. We can also do clustering and find a hierarchical taxonomic structure and use the same sort of model and also find the best fit when we have some kind of basic level bias. There's some more complexities to this, but since I'm out of time, I won't tell you about those. Um, so let me just, again, highlight the contrast, both the similarities and the differences between this task and this model and the other model. Um, they both reflect aspects of learning about natural kinds, two of the most important kinds of learning we have to do in the real world. We have to learn about the properties of natural kinds and we have to learn words to refer to them, right? So it makes sense that there would be some underlying domain structure in common uh, across these two kinds of tasks. That would be the taxonomy, right? But there, there are important differences in how words are used and how properties are distributed in the world, and that's reflected in the different kinds of probabilistic models that we use to generate the priors in these two domains. Uh, I was going to do some more. I guess I was too ambitious. Um, I'll skip the problem of acquisition of theories, but if you're interested, that's, a, that's an important open challenge. M many people have proposed that if there are strong, if there are strong domain theories like this hierarchical theory in biology, that it would have to be there innately. Um, with nothing better than sort of generic poverty of the stimulus type arguments. But what, we can, what we've been trying to show is how you, uh, how, how you could acquire those theories in the same way with the same kinds of statistical inference machinery you might use in using those theories to generalize new things. It's kind of like the analog of grammar induction, uh, whereas before we were talking about the analog of parsing. Um, and uh, I can also tell you about some machine learning things. I'll just skip to my end here. Um, uh, so, in sum, um, I've tried to present a framework for, for generalizing, uh, for, for understanding how people solve this inductive generalization problem from very limited data in a way that combines what are often seen in cognitive science as, again, these very uh, sort of dichotomous approaches to learning. Uh, in particular, domain general and domain specific. We have domain specific knowledge structures. Uh, which, which are also task specific, like the difference between a mutation prior for properties and a taxonomic prior for words. Uh, but we also have underlying it all a domain general statistical inference framework for rational inference. And it's the interaction of these two which explains how learning can work, right? What, what makes any inference process go through is if the prior knowledge that your system has matches the structure of your world and you use some kind of rational inference machinery for moving from that prior knowledge plus observed data to conclusions. Uh, you need to have both domain specific and domain general components to explain any inference really. And we're showing how that works in these cognitive areas. Um, again, what I think is, what is mo potentially most interesting from a cognitive science point of view then about this is a tool for studying knowledge. The kind of, the kind of um, theories that we're suggesting people have are, the, are intrinsically unobservable, right? They're just implicit biases which guide our behavior. And some of these things have been posited before, like people have posited hierarchical theories of biology. Others of them haven't. As, as far as I know, nobody's proposed that there's any kind of a, 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 an implicit knowledge of, of the distribution that goes with mutations. 
in biology. But by, by developing these rational sort of ideal observer models and seeing how, what, what, what kinds of prior knowledge we need to, ex to explain people's behavior, it gives us a powerful tool for actually for trying to figure out what is the implicit abstract knowledge that people have about the world that's guiding their ability to learn from so few examples. I'll stop there. Thanks. So as you can tell, I wasn't able to get to a large part of my talk. I guess I somehow saw an hour and a half and thought, oh, maybe I'll talk for an hour and a half. Um, but I guess you, have, you, you normally have questions. Um, so if, uh, if you, feel free to ask whatever questions you like, or if you want to ask about parts of the talk that I skipped, like acquiring theories or applications of machine learning, I'm happy to talk about that too. Would you still have a mutation process? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Because it seems to me that you know the idea might simply be that what is a classification system? Yep. It's something that groups things together according to common properties, but we know that they can't be done perfectly. Mm -hmm. So there's some chance that something just has to give in right. one category. Maybe the chances of that is lambda. Yeah. Although is the question is is it is it e to the minus lambda b or not? <laughs> right. Does it depend on the branch length? But yeah. Anyway. Um. I mean. Uh. The notion of, ex of sort of a process for accounting for exceptions is, is very related to the mutation process, but there's more to it in the mutation process, right? Which is this bias for sort of di distinguishing more distinctive clusters from less distinctive clusters in terms of the ones which are at the ends of long branches. But anyway, that's, that's a technical detail. I think your basic point I totally agree with. Um, and I think there could be many reasons for this, for why some model like this might be much more broadly applicable than biology. Um, one is just because it's, you can use the same machinery to get a kind of um, r robustness to exceptions in the presence of some kind of basically correct ontology, taxonomic ontology. Uh, but the other is that some kind of evolutionary type process actually operates in a lot of domains outside of biology, or something which is not identical to, but similar enough that you might get similar kinds of things. In lots of domains of, of artifacts or concepts, people have talked about some kind of the mutation and selection process as guiding the design or the evolution of ideas. Um, and it could well be that that, uh, you know, that, that that would make this kind of prior much more broadly applicable. I mean, certainly you, you took an example of code, computer code or, or classes. I mean, typically, whether it's, you're talking about computer code or object classes, they're often formed by taking one that currently works and improving it in some way or trying to speak out and seeing which ones work best. So it's, it wouldn't all surprise me if actually the underlying dynamics that generates uh, other kinds of objects would, would fit this sort of prior too. designed the stimuli in the, in the first place to have basic level categories in the middle. So then we just sort of reminded ourselves of what we had designed in the first place. And, and you can see that in subjects, um, in subjects clustering, you can see those clusters there, um, at least certainly in the, with the familiar objects. It's actually kind of something in, interestingly different happened with the, um, I, I can actually show you because I have this one extra slide here. With the new object, we were able to compare clustering before we're learning and after we're learning to see if you like, it's sort of a Worfian question. What's the effect of language on thought here? What's the effect of learning word labels for these kinds of things in terms of how you organize the taxonomy? And so this is, this is just abstractly, this is the tree structure before word learning from one group of subjects. And then here's the tree structure, uh, oh, here's the tree structure from another group of subjects after learning. The, what I've done in both cases is highlight the, each of the categories that are circled in red is one of the, um, what we thought of as one of the basic superordinate or subordinate categories that the words would map onto. Um, and what you can see is that each of the, e even before word learning, this is sort of important for our story, right? Even before word learning, each of the 
each of the categories corresponding to a word that we thought subjects might learn is there in this clustering. Right? It's as if that, I mean, again, this is all implicit in their similarity judgments, but it's as if they sort of already have this, the, the possibility for these taxonomic hypotheses in their sense of similarity in this novel domain. Um, but then what happens after you see a few examples, or actually see a few examples of a bunch of different words, well, you can see the clustering gets a lot stronger. So um, one thing that happens, actually, if you see how all the red circles move down, basically everything's gotten more similar, which kind of makes sense. Um, Within, within clusters, at least. And, and between big clusters, they've gotten less similar. Well, they, have, but, they now have another property, which is they share the same name. Yeah, that's right, right. But, but you see, so uh, that's right, but it, it, putting it that way misses one of the main points of the talk, which is that a name is not just another property, right? What we saw is that if you want to model word learning, you, 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 you need to have a prior which doesn't just treat it as a property that can mutate throughout the tree. Um, the prior we had was much was, was just this taxonomic prior, right? Where I shouldn't blame you for for brushing over this because I, I know I went over it super fast. The, the the key difference between the model for the word learning and for the property induction was that for for word learning, for, for the the hypotheses were just the, the nodes in the tree, um, not the possibility of having labelings that cross branches of the tree, which would be generated by a mutation process. It's all, you could also think of it as like having a mutation rate that approaches zero. Right? If mutations are extremely rare, then uh, almost all the time it's, there's just going to be a single branch that has one feature in common and the rest of the tree has the other value. Right? So there's an important difference in the prior. And that's going to, uh, that's, that's going to come, that's going to come in, in terms of how learning words should affect your tree structure versus just learning a property. Right? So if, let's say you saw a, a, some novel property which doesn't quite fit your tree structure. Well, it's, it's fairly easy to chalk it up to some weird mutation and then move on without changing your underlying tree structure. But if you, if you consistently get words which don't map onto nodes in your taxonomy and seem to cross-cut things, then that is a strong cue that uh, you have the wrong taxonomy. Does, does that make sense intuitively? Um, we don't have evidence for that, direct evidence for that here, though that's something we're trying to look at. And if you remember that the version of the model I presented where you have the taxonomy is basically a, a probabilistic, uh, it's a structural description that's a probabilistic generator for the observed features. If you think of that as also a generator for the observed word labels, then each of those would impose constraints on what structural description is the best one for this domain. But because you have the mutation process, which allows a lot more variance for the properties, and you don't have that mutation process for the words, the words just have to map onto taxonomic categories or with much lower mutation rate, they will, that generative model naturally makes the words impose stronger constraints on the tree structure. So you'd be more likely to try to line up things in the same cluster of the tree that have, uh, or one branch of the tree, if they have the same word, than, than, than just if they had some arbitrary property in common. So that's, that's an important empirical direction for us to look at. Yeah? If you, if you did the foreign, foreign violence to a child, maybe you would introduce in his world only two animals, namely cats and dogs. Mm. And you'd be very careful about their sizes so that you know, dogs would not be bigger and right. cats, and also you'd make sure that they don't bark and give other, give other signs of them being dogs or or, uh, or cats. Yeah. W would children recognize, you know, distinguish between, uh, you know, and now you've introduced a new dog or cat, etc. You know, I mean, of course, they know nothing about biology. Wait, so, so are you saying they don't know about mutations? Question, if cats were known, yeah, that's what I thought you said. If cats were physically identical to dogs, or well, that is something cat-like about cats, right? I mean, they, but, they walk differently. Okay, so if you, if you make all the static visual cues the same, yes. Well, I mean, yeah. I, so I, I think they would learn to tell the difference. I mean, there's lots of evidence that cats. I mean, but it would not be by these principles. Well, so again, the the remember how I, I made a contrast between the. Um, so, so, so I, I made a comparison between this intuitive biological reasoning and scientific biology, right? And I said that actually it's pretty similar. The only difference is what features do you take as the groundwork on which the, the, the theory operates? So for, for, for people, it's you know, the anatomy and behavior of objects, actually including behavior. Um, for scientists these days, it's genes, although it used to be more like for people, right? And, um, and people's intuitive classification looks more the way scientists used to classify things several hundred years ago. Okay, so the point of this kind of a theory is that it doesn't actually matter what features it operates on. It's like the same grammar. You can take a grammar of a language and change all the words, 
Um, and it's the same grammar, right? But, um, but superficially looks very different, right? So what I would say is that you know, to a first approximation at least, you could apply exactly the same theory to features of motion as you could to features of static appearance uh, and, and still be able to construct this, the same kind of structure. But that's it. that would be an interesting uh, experiment to do. <laughs> So um, I think people have something like your first, the, the, the people don't just assume that these are just arbitrary facts, right? Um, but how people describe their intuitions are not necessarily a reliable guide to how we should model them mathematically, right? So the model that we have here isn't, it's, it's, it's not assuming that people, that, that the data are somehow deliberately provided to circumscribe the class, like the most, the tightest possible, I mean that would suggest Never generalizing at all. Well, so um, if you think that, and somebody says seals and dolphins to you, clearly that skews, even if you've got a squirrel in there, that skews you over to thinking that there's something special about it. Yeah, them. right. But I mean, if, if you really thought they were trying to circumscribe the class, why would you go beyond it at all? I mean, what, what, what the, the model that we have in our, this is in our likelihood of our Bayesian framework, is assumes this kind of, it's a kind of random sampling, but it's random sampling from the concept. So it assumes that what you're getting are a sample of positive examples, uh, a representative one. It, representative just in the sense that you're actually sampling them from the correct concept and not from some other concept. And then that naturally gives you kind of a soft version of this intuition that you don't want to, that you want to kind of, that they somehow map out the spread of, of the concept and you don't want to generalize too far beyond. But, be, but the, it's, in, it's in the nature of this statistical model that uh, the more examples you get, the tighter you should your bounds should be, right? I mean, if you want to think sort of geometrically, and we've also done some simple experiments like this, um, you know, imagine that your concepts are sort of rectangles in some space. This is a common machine learning problem, right? And if you just had a few positive examples, and you say, well, what rectangle are these drawn from? You know, you might choose something like this. But if you had, you know, a very large number of examples like this, well, then you would say the concept is just this much tighter bound, right? And that's just sort of sensible statistical estimation. Uh, does that, does that address your question? It, it does. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I agree it's a really interesting question. What are people actually thinking? Um, we actually did one experiment to try to uh, manipulate what people were thinking by varying, by sort of varying the conditions under which the data were provided to people yeah. to see if they would be sensitive to the sampling assumptions. We actually did this with the word learning paradigm that I showed you. So in the standard word learning paradigm that many people have used and that which we use here, there's somebody who appears to know the word, providing examples, saying, you know, this is a blicket, oh, here's a nice blicket, here's a blicket, right? So you get three examples from a competent speaker. Um, we came up with a, a, another version of the experiment where a bunch of people come into the room all at once, and they're told that they're gonna be learning these words, but one person is selected as a volunteer, and that person is going to choose the examples. So nobody knows the no, nobody here knows the words, knows what the words mean, but let's say I pick you, and I say, okay, you just curry me, you ask me which, uh, you, you, you know, you, you ask me for each one, is this a blicket or not, right? And then I'll tell you yes or no. Um, so what's the difference in these two cases? Well, if I'm telling you it's a blicket, you can assume I'm sampling my examples from the set of blickets. Whereas if you're choosing and you don't know the word, well, it's not so clear what to assume. I mean, one thing you might assume is that you're just choosing things at random, or maybe you're doing some active hypothesis testing or something. It's, but, it's, but it's a very different kind of generative model. And sort of under all those possibilities, you should be much more, um, if, if, you know, if, suppose I, as the knowledgeable speaker, give you three examples and they're all Dalmatians, then there's this co sort of suspicious coincidence thing that wants to make you narrow in on just Dalmatians. But if you, as somebody who doesn't know the word, just happen to pick Dalmatians, and I don't know why you're picking Dalmatians, and they all turn out to be yes, 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 you know, it could still well be that it's dogs, and for just some reason you only pick Dalmatians. Now, the way we actually do the experiment is the, the volunteer is actually not a volunteer, but is a stooge. Right. And so the volunteer picks exactly the same objects 
uh, and they get labeled in exactly the same way as in the other condition the experimenter gets. Right? So we can have a, have a nice contrast where the data are the same, but just the sampling assumptions have changed. And we see the effect that we predict, which is that people are quicker to, to narrow their generalizations when there's a competent speaker giving the data, when they can think of it as a representative sample from the concept, than when some person is just arbitrarily choosing these things. And as far as what do people think, well, they get very uncomfortable. <laughs> people start rolling their eyes, saying, why are you only choosing Dalmatians? Or things like that. I mean, it's, it's like a social psychology experiment. I, it's not the normal sort of work that I do, but it certainly is, causes, it actually causes some, some dissonance for people because they don't, people don't seem to be following or what to them is a good sampling strategy. Yeah? I wonder, I mean, a lot of what you were talking about earlier in the talk was involved in evaluating a model against the, uh, the Oshersen in general, yep. the Oshersen in specific. And yep. I don't know what the sign in uh, were, but I'll assume. You don't know what the what were? The, the, the third class. Of oh, the yeah, yeah, right. That was just a, a, a we were varied so the number of examples. My basic question is first of all, what, who were these judgments coming from? They, they were coming from, uh, yeah. Co Sorry, what? Yeah, a lot of them were MIT students, actually. Well, um, so it's very plausible that MIT students have a very rich knowledge of mm -hmm. biology. And, and I wonder if um, you probe them on other things that, that uh, their biological knowledge might not lead them to expect groupings according to these clusters, say, can solve the tower of, of Hanoi problem. Can solve the Wait, about elephants? You mean you say like yeah. elephants can solve the power of my problem? Yeah, sure. Yeah. We, you, know, you can get sure. pigeons to peck at the rain. Right. Or, sure. So the thing is, I'm wondering if you would get, if you, if you predict the same kinds of performance on those kinds of. Well, that's interesting. Or if this really is just a so tapping into their knowledge of the. the, the is the is the critical difference that you're asking about whether it's a biological property or whether it's. Um, Whether something. the knowledge that they think they're drawing on has the kind of hierarchical structure that... Ah, uh, okay. Yes, so, so, so one thing that uh, you know, I could have told you about in another talk is a whole tradition of research that was kind of a response to this work with blank predicates. Um, it seems like, you know, they're, they're, I, I think that, the, that what, what the data that I found and the other people have found seem to pretty well map out what's going on with these blank biological predicates. But there's a lot, as I think you're pointing out, there's a lot of other things we might be able to reason about in any domain, including animals, that, that don't necessarily follow the core ontology of the domain, but might reflect other knowledge we have about these things, right? And so uh, people have been studying the same kinds of tasks with, with what they call non-blank predicates, which just means predicates where we have some relevant prior knowledge which goes beyond the basic ontology. And we, we've, we've got several different versions of our model where the, the, I, I think we have a nice way of treating that by basically, again, keeping the same Bayesian framework, but just changing the theory somewhat. Um, so, and there's sort of weaker and, 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 and bigger changes. A weak change, like for example, suppose it's something about you know, their ability to learn some task. Well, that we might think is related to the taxonomy, because we know intelligence tends to cluster, like you know, chimp or primates tend to be more intelligent, the aquatic mammals tend to be intelligent, um, and that sort of thing, that maybe dogs tend to be intelligent or something. Um, so, so a, a reasonable way to model that might be to keep the tree structure taxonomy, but say you have some prior, instead of having a mutation process where the, the feature is equally likely to switch anywhere in the tree, you have some biased mutation process where it's, it's most likely to switch between branches which you think um, are, differ on the relevant features for solving the Tower of Hanoi problem. Like you have some knowledge of intelligence, you think these branches are generally more intelligent, so you, you have a, a mutation process where the, the prior is, it's, says it's more likely for the, for the, for this people to be able to solve this task if they're in some sort of the relevant branches, right? But you still don't know exactly where this is. Maybe the task is a lot easier than you thought. So maybe everybody can solve it. Um, so you can, there's, there's, there's basically ways to um, assess people's priors for some particular feature and then modify the mutation rates in the minimal possible way to account for those priors and then predict judgments on these kind of tasks. But there are other ones where the reasoning is much, is really just beyond taxonomic. It has more to do with the causal interactions between animals. Um, for example, you can, uh, this goes beyond animals, but it's still in biology. You could say, which of these is a stronger generalization? That um, given that carrots have a certain enzyme, that rabbits will have a certain enzyme, or given that rabbits have a certain enzyme, that carrots will have a certain enzyme. 
So most people prefer to generalize from carrots to rabbits and from rabbits to carrots. Taxonomically, well, not, I mean, there's no reason to generalize at all. But you know that rabbits eat carrots. Uh, and, and, you, and if you think about sort of, I mean, basically, you can, you can make a version of this, the same kind of model, where instead of a tree structure, imagine a causal network that represents the causal interactions of you know, who eats who, right? under the idea that that's going to causally mediate you know, things like enzymes, or you can try to model disease susceptibility, or things like that. And you can, you can, use, you can use this alternative, I mean, it, it, well, I want to stress the parallels with what we were doing, as well as the differences. Basically, you have a different kind of graph structure. Instead of a tree structure, you have a, a, a directed graph representing causal interactions. But you can still define a stochastic generative model over this, like say, you know, uh, there's some probability that, that some feature, like having a certain enzyme, will arise anywhere in this graph, and then some probability that it will propagate down the causal links. And that will also define a generative model over ways of labeling this, this uh, domain, which will now reflect very different kinds of biases, and it will have asymmetries built into it. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that, that's, that's, that's definitely the direction that we're going in to try to, again, show the generality of this approach, but also how it interacts with very different kinds of domain theory structures. And of course, there's the nice thing about this is that the same domain of, of living kinds can have multiple theories superimposed on it. Therefore, there are different ways of construing these things, and that definitely shows up in people's reasoning. Yeah. I'm just the, um, the example of the Occam um, prior that you yeah. considered was one especially simple way of construing the Occam prior. Yeah. So I was just wondering whether so it sort of gets back to the issue of to what degree is is this mutation process really crucial, mm. or if you have other kind of cleverer ways of assigning probabilities to distributions, could you yeah. get the same results? So in particular, I wonder if it has some kind of MDL sort of thing where you take as a kind of description of a class the a, a, the, the bit sequence of left-right branches in the tree that will take you to the categories that dominate the <coughs> and if you have that have I think that will be the same. Um, the same as what? As, as, the, as the Occam prior. I mean, if it's just about how many branch, how many no, left-right things you have to make. No, no, because for example, that would prefer that you have, this will give a preference for broader classes rather than narrower classes. Um, so how does, how does the, length, it the length of the path, so for example, who Oh, length of, okay, so is it just about, well, I, I'd have to look into the details, okay. so I don't know, I mean, it might work. Yeah. Um, and it'd be an interesting question whether you, whether it would naturally make any different predictions from what we're doing. I mean, this, right. this mutation process is just a random, you can also think of it as a random walk on the tree. Yeah, sure. Like, it, so there could be lots of other ways of approximating a random walk. I think an important constraint, though, which, which I tried to show with this data set, is you really need um, something which prefers mutations or switches to happen along long branches rather than short branches. And, you know, by far, the, to me, the most compelling explanation for why that should be is because that's the way it works in the world. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Or should we wrap up? No? Go ahead. Uh, I'll save my question for dinner. Sure. Uh, but I, I just wanted to make a comment sure. um, for, the, for the sake of uh, the part of the audience that's still left. Uh, actually, two. One is that uh, I, I think it's really nice work, uh, in part because this is exactly the way that uh, we those of us who are thinking about the world when we're being engineers. Yeah. So if we want a computer to solve right. the problem, exactly. that's exactly what we build. Right. Uh, and it's really nice to see that humans seem to be doing more or less the same thing, because humans are also exists to prove that any of this uh, is the stuff that we're trying to do is yeah. possible at all. Yeah. Um, the, the, other, the other half of the comment is that, um, and this is particularly clear, I think, in the grid uh, that you showed of a number of species uh, with all the properties that they had, where you right. use a clustering and then try to generalize. Right. Yeah, exactly this. Um, th this is very similar to uh, some problems that we have, th that we have uh, as engineering problems in yep. this field. And I'll point one out. This is the one that we started discussing this right. afternoon right. Uh, that Jay and I are about to start working on, right. um, which is where uh, your species are verbs, for example, uh, and their features are the nouns that they appear with. And you want to say, given that these verbs appear with some nouns, which verbs are similar to one another, and which other nouns might they appear with in the future. Right. Uh, and exactly the same kinds of methods, I think, can be used. Right. No, yeah, I mean, it basically, the problem that we're working here, I mean, th th this is one version of the problem where you have this observed data matrix, and then you have this sparsely observed column, and you want to fill in this column, right? But more generally, you could say the problem is just you have a sparsely observed matrix, yep. and you want to fill in the entry. And then, but, but, but yeah, and so many problems in computational linguistics are exactly of that form. Yeah, and, that's right. So right. It, it's, if it's just this form, actually, you know, people like Thomas Hoffman or uh, right. the people who sort of did the, the initial work in this. But we, uh, in the case of uh, linguistics, we have things like WordNet. 
So we have existing taxonomies that right. uh, you know we don't necessarily have to infer them. No. That's right. We, we do a ways to infer them using you know distributional clustering and things like that. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. So so um, another place where this taxonomy could come from is somewhere else. Like it doesn't have to be inferred. That's exactly right. Um, and there's another another. Uh, person who's worked on that, uh, if you know David Carger at MIT, and uh, his student, um, Kai Shi, Shi is his last name, S-H-I-H, uh, she, she did some work as part of his thesis, that sounds weird, but she did this work, um, in which he basically, he, it was sort of a web information personalization system. Yeah, it's a lot of it's exactly the same problem. Yeah, basically, but in particular, he used the fact that it was he was working with web pages where there's a natural hierarchy imposed by the domain, uh, you know, slash 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 whatever you call that, um, the address, and and, and, he, and he used who's like what? sorry what? And you want to predict who's going to want to read what? That's right. And so he used a a very similar, almost identical algorithm, slightly different mutation process, but also it was motivated by a biological analogy, um, and got uh, very nice results. So I think we ought to thank you again. Okay. Thanks.